Adaptive MCMC with Bayesian optimization, and this will be presented by Nimaran Mahendran. Thanks. Okay, um, so this is work that I did with ZU for Alex and Nando at UBC. What we're doing here is basically using uh, Bayesian optimization with Gaussian processes to adapt the parameters of an MCMC algorithm. So let's start with the setting of adaptive MCMC. We have um, you know, the, the metropolis hasting algorithm with a target distribution and a parameterized proposal where your parameter space is in RD. And, we, and so the performance of a sampler often depends a lot on the parameter settings for that distribution. The motivating, uh, thing, the motivating work behind this was the intracluster move sampler, which Faraz and Nando came up with and published earlier, uh, that basically draws samples from a constrained state space. The constraint is that all the samples are from a certain hamming distance away from a reference state. And in this talk, the, the reference state is basically the ground state where everything is zero. Uh, so the way that it works is it goes in a self-awarding walk uh, out of that constrained uh, state, and then it goes back to that state on a, on a self-awarding walk, walk the other way for the same length. So there's two parameters. One is the length of that walk, and the other one is a biasing parameter that decides how much you bias um, high, uh, sorry, low energy states. And so, he tested this algorithm on uh, three different models. The ferromagnetic 2D grid, uh, a frustrated 3D grid, and a restricted Boltzmann machine that's trained on natural image patches. So essentially what he had to do was manually tune the parameters to each of these things, and it took a long time. And it really affected how well the, the algorithm did. But I don't have to go into that kind of complicated setting to justify it. So this is just uh, a simple example, you know, Gaussian proposal, Gaussian target, and if you, don't, if you have a, a variance that's too, too narrow, then you're going to reject a lot of samples. But if you have a, a more wider uh, proposal for this particular distribution, then you accept more. And so uh, th there's an adaptive method that's already been, that's been proposed a while ago, which basically proposes uh, with, a, with a distribution that is centered on the current uh, sample. And it uses as its covariance matrix, the empirical covariance matrix, plus a bit of noise, that scale by a certain um, amount. So that amount seems a bit arbitrary, but it's actually based on a theoretical result that says that your optimal acceptance ratio should be that. So um, <coughs> a lot of the existing adaptive MCMC methods use this kind of stochastic ascent, sorry, this um, gradient ascent method. So H is, is your objective function that you're optimizing against and G is a gradient. And you just do an update as you go along, finding better and better parameters. Uh, but in our, in our setting, we have proposed an example, uh, proposed and accepted samples, and based on this, we do stochastic approximation to find a good set of parameters. So there are some limitations to the previous kind of work. One of them is that you need these things like an optimal acceptance rate or an objective function that you can compute the gradient of. 
Um, another thing is that just like stochastic ascent, you need a lot of iterations, which can be a problem if, if the objective function you're optimizing over is costly. And also you can get stuck in local optima. The other thing is that, you know, in our case, we didn't even know what to optimize. So that led to Bayesian optimized MCMC. Uh, so this basically uses Bayesian optimization, so you don't need <laughs> observations to the gradient, you just need observations of, of the objective function value, and they can be noisy. Um, and the method itself is explicitly designed to trade off exploitation and exploration, so you can minimize the number of times you have to evaluate the function. And then what we do is we basically we, we model that function and then we construct a randomized policy over that and use that randomized policy when we're sampling. So our setting was there's no optimal acceptance rate and we're not even sure what to optimize. But we figured that it seems reasonable that MCMC algorithms should use something based on the autocorrelation function because if you minimize this, then presumably you change the mixing fast. But it's not clear how to evaluate the gradient of this, although we can just draw some samples and then compute the autocorrelation, which brings us to adaptive MCMC. So here we have this two-stage adaptation mechanism where we basically, in the adaptation phase, try a bunch of parameter settings and learn a model of the function and then once we have that model, we construct a discrete stochastic policy out of it and, and use that to draw samples. So it's like, it's a loop that looks like this. Um, first we run the Markov chain for a certain number of steps with a certain parameter, and then we use those drawn samples to get a noisy evaluation of the objective function. And then we augment the data, and in our case, use the GP. So we update the GP sufficient statistics, and then optimize over that GP to get the next parameter settings to query. And because the GP has uh, n squared, uh, sorry, n cube complexity which, with respect to the number of query points, we um, do this two-stage thing, so we don't have to adapt as often. So I'll talk a bit about the components that are involved here. Uh, the other correlation function is what we base our objective function on, but we couldn't just use this. One of the problems is that we're not sure what time lag to look at, so we just averaged over all of them for a certain length. And then uh, we don't care about the sign of that autocorrelation, so we absolutely valued it, and then we made it a maximization instead of a minimization. The other problem is that when you switch parameters, you're not sure if uh, the parameters that you're looking at are actually uh, representative of the, sorry, the samples you're looking at are actually representative of the uh, parameters that you're using. So we averaged over the last few sample state windows. And so we draw samples and we essentially get a noisy estimate of this. And since we're using a Gaussian process, we end up with a noise model, which is uh, zero mean Gaussian, same variance across the board. So here's the Gaussian process. I'll just go over it really high level. Um, the black line is the mean function that we learned. That's the model of a function. The shaded areas denote like uh, the, the variance function, which basically says how uncertain we are about this function at that point. And the, the dots are where we've queried it. So, it's, so the variance is very low, but not exactly zero at the places where we've queried it. And as we get further away, um, it increases. And that's because of the kernel. That, that's done by the kernel function, which I'll talk about in a bit. So if you look at this function at a particular point, it's essentially a mean and a, and a Gaussian. It's a, sorry, a variance. It's a univariate Gaussian. So any way you plug in theta for a certain uh, hi plus one, you basically get a univariate Gaussian. And the kernel function we used was just a straight up ARD kernel with a length scale of hyperparameters, which you could estimate, but we just kind of set them you know, intuitively. Um, and then the acquisition function, which is what we actually optimize to choose the next point to query, is the expected improvement. So you know, improvement tells you how much better you're going to do than the best parameter settings you've seen so far. But we don't know, we, we're not certain about the function, so we take the expectation of it. And because it's a univariate Gaussian, it ends up being an uh, expected improvement, which is uh, cheap to, to compute relative to what we're optimizing over. So in this case, you could just use the direct optimizer and, and figure out what where you should query. So we run this loop over and over again until we get this kind of surface. Like This is our model of, of what that objective function probably is, is like. And at this point, we have to sample. So we use that Gaussian process model, that mean function, to create um, a stochastic policy. And then we run the Markov chain with those parameter settings. So how do we do this in high dimension? What we do is, this is what we did, but 
we use the Boltzmann policy of the learned GP, so we just take the exponential of the, the mean function. And then we use a multi-start uh, optimizer to find the maximum of that. And once again, it's easy to, it's cheap to query, so we can do that. And then you just perform local exploration and get a bunch of candidates. And then you can retain whatever number you, number you want. We did like resample and, and retain a certain bunch. And out of that, you get a uh, policy, which is roughly proportional to the original surface. So that's the method, and then we applied it to uh, Firaz's sampler. So essentially, uh, this sampler works over constraint discrete state spaces where we're only concerned with a restricted subset. Um, everything else has no support. And <coughs> this is once again the intracostal move sampler. It has two parameters, um, you know, a certain set of, of lengths and an energy biasing parameter, which we have to tune for the three models that we looked at. Uh, yeah, so in, in the previous paper's case, these were manually tuned. And so in our experiments, we looked at four, four, four algorithms. Um, the Kawasaki sampler is, is basically the predecessor of IM sampler, and it involves flipping a bit and then flipping another bit uniformly to get a new sample. So pretty simplistic. And actually it does so, so bad that I'm just not gonna address it in the graphs. So there's this line up at the top that is Kawasaki. Then the IM expert is the, uh, the sampler that was tuned by an expert in the paper. So uh, what happened there was essentially it was he, one gamma was picked and then a certain range of, of uh, saw lengths. And then the, they, they just ended up drawing uniformly from that saw length. Um, and then, then there's the method here, which is uh, IM base opt, which does Gaussian process regression over that parameter set of space. And then IM uniform is a baseline, which just draws uh, parameters kind of uniformly from, from that parameter space. So our method has a bunch of parameters, which we set um, you know, arbitrarily. Like it, it didn't, we didn't actually have to put much work into getting these, uh, like to, into tuning this. So for instance, for uh, the number of adaptations, the number of steps for adaptation, we, we used 100 samples. And the number of adaptations we used overall was also 100. So overall, we used 10,000 samples to, to learn the parameter space. Um, then we set up observation noise and a, and a lag and a minimum interval length. And the kernel hyperparameters were just set to, to be proportional to the size of the intervals that we're looking at for each, for each dimension. <coughs> so here are the algorithm parameter feasible sets. Um, there's, two, there's two types of algorithms, the expert one, and then the IM uniform one and the, uh, the Bayesian optimization one. So we, we set it such that uh, IM uniform and IM base opt both draw from a much larger space than, than the expert one. So I'll go over some results. Um, for the ferromagnetic 2D grid, what we have here is, like the green line is IM uniform and uh, it's doing a lot worse. This is the autocorrelation function over a certain number of lags with error bars over five trials. Um, whereas our method and the expert train method are doing about the same in terms of autocorrelation drop off. If you look at the energy that are, energies that of the states that are drawn, we happen to be drawing lower energies for this particular model. But as you'll see, it doesn't hold for the next one. The response function uh, that we learned is, is this. And one of the modes that's captured here is actually the same parameter settings that were settled on by the expert. So we've found a bunch of other, we found a few other modes and are using them as well. For the next example, um, the 3D cube, we have about the same behavior. You can see that it's really important to train the, the parameter settings, especially for this one, because I uniform is doing terrible and uh, we're doing about the same as the expert. You can see how bad, well, if you could see the line, you can see that IM uniform is doing really, really bad. This looks like a lot of correlation between the samples. Whereas our samples seem very similar to what, um, you know, the expert's doing. And here's the response function we learned. So the, the parameter settings that, um, the expert found for, for, for this problem was to use a certain gamma and to use saw lengths that are between one and 20. So if you look at the, the deep red over there, it's essentially what we've learned, plus a bunch of other stuff, but 
that would explain why we're kind of seeing the same thing. But for the RBM, the red line is the expert, and we're doing much better in terms of water correlation drop off. Um, and if you look at also the, the energies that we're drawing, we're drawing low energy states. And in this case, the response function we've learned is, uh, so the one, one that, that the expert found was um, less than 25 and for a certain fixed gamma. And we found a few other modes that we're take, making use of. So conclusions. Um, essentially, manual, manual tooling does help a lot in this particular setting. But Bayesian optimization realizes the same gains without any kind of human in intervention. And for one model, the more complicated one, the one that was harder to tune, we did significantly better. And the nice thing is that um, it's a general method for adapting parameters of any MCMC algorithm, although it is actually complementary to the, you know, the Gaussian stuff and the stochastic approximation type methods from before. And I'm happy to say that, like, we've come up with a new sampler called Sardonics, which is more general than the IM sampler, and it works for uh, unconstrained state space distributions. So the full Ising model state space, um, using the same kind of principle of Solinks and SolWaps. Um, and this one has eight parameters, but it didn't have to be tuned by any human. So for future work, uh, some things that would be nice to do are scaling this to higher dimensions. Uh, so right now, the, the highest dimension we've done is, is eight dimensions, but you know, we have Bayesian optimization code for using, you know, doing it up to 50 dimensions, but those are, are running on random forests, so also in line with that, looking at alternative to GPs. Our observation model is pretty simplistic, you know, the same Gaussian zero mean noise everywhere, so we could improve that. And my, the objective function is kind of ugly, so we could probably design a better one, although it works. Um, and also it'd be nice to kind of provide some kind of guarantees around how long it actually takes to make. Thanks. Yeah. So if I understand well, you stop the adaptation mechanism at some point, the adaptation mechanism at some point, right? Yep. Have you tried letting it run? I, I didn't because it would take longer to run as time goes on, like n cube. So I just didn't have the patience to sit around. But I mean, it worked well enough for 100. So yeah. Like some sampling. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could do something like that. Like we, we could change the, the points that we have in the GP and, and keep going. Yeah, definitely. And I guess as we go to higher dimensions, that would be more useful. Yeah. <laughs> One key thing in adaptive MTF is, is the convergence of the actual distribution. So if you continue running that, would it converge to the right distribution? Oh, um, yeah. So the thing is that once we, once we shift to the sampling phase, we're essentially just doing with a kernel of M like regular MCMC kernels, right? Like yeah. a mixture of regular MCMC kernels. I guess that's the only way, like a, you need to have the diminishing adaptation to be able to. So, to yeah, I mean. Like, if you could keep running Bayesian optimization with GPs, then you could, uh, I mean, maybe you could, because of the consistency results behind Bayesian optimization, have that. But what we did, because of the practical limitation of the n cubed bound, is that we just ended up stopping it and then using a mixture of kernels. So, can I follow up that question? So, if you're then actually going to do something with the samples, do you treat the whole adaptation uh, stage as kind of a, a burden period and use a, a mixture kernel over all of those and run a sampler on that? Or what do you actually do? Or do you, do you average over the samples during the whole uh, adaptation? So, so the, the latter seems like it could be problematic. Oh, yeah. So, so, so in, our, um, in our experiments, what we did was we would run adaptation to find that policy. And then we would start from the same state as every other sampler. So we're, we're basically learning like this policy and then just dropping everything else, dropping all the previous samples. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>